diagram. Can you hear me? coming? So let me start with the machine learning introduction. So first, uh, uh, before that, I want to introduce our team. So I belong to the Advanced Mission Concept Technology, and this is uh, who we are. I think uh, you know most of us. So first, some guidelines for this lecture. So I want to go more conceptual, so I don't want to dive into the, the math or mathematical proofs. There will be some math, some formula and so, but uh, very light, I would say. And I want to focus more on examples. So it's more, I want more you to understand what you can do with that. There will be some hands-on, and they will use uh, Python to make the point of the lectures, but not for today, because today is more an introduction. So what we have for today is what is machine learning, some examples, how it works, what the learning means, some concepts, and some uh, for the next session, we are going to discuss techniques and examples in Python. So artificial intelligence, what it is, is many things. It uh, could be reasoning, could be knowledge, planning, machine learning, <coughs> natural language processing, perception. We can move, manipulate objects by a robot or so. Uh, but what is uh, being increasingly popular these days are these three, so mostly machine learning, perception, natural language, has been increasingly popular over the last year. And these are the one we are going to cover in these uh, sessions. So what's machine learning? I like this definition. It's the science and art of programming computers so that they can learn from data. So there are more formal definitions that uh, I will leave, uh, I will leave uh, there for you to check. By the way, the, the slides will be available in ESA Connect, so you don't need to take note or anything. There are some more definitions, but there is a bit more formal and I leave for reference if you like to check. So how is different from a, a, a computer program? If you like a computer program, you get the data as an input, the program perform a task with this data, and you get the results as an output. This is a classical uh, program with machine learning. You put some data, you get some results, and instead of being done by a program, it's done by a model. So the difference, because it, it looks like from this point of view that it's quite the same, is how the program or the model is built. The program is built by software developer that takes the requirements and it writes a program. For machine learning, the way it works is that you provide historical mapping of data and results. So you know already which result corresponds to which data. And you give this to a model, to train a model, and then you can use it. This only works for some task, so I don't see like uh, this replacing software developers, so it's uh, only for some kind of task. And I want to show you some examples of uh, which kind of task can be done with machine learning. So for instance, spam filter is uh, one of the classical examples and one of the oldest. And today we're not getting that much spam, I will say. And one of the reasons is that most uh, applications now use um, a spam filter. Another thing which is also quite uh, useful is a recommendation engine for cross-selling. I don't know if you use uh, Amazon or Netflix or so. You will have this kind of technology. Predicting for how much a uh, property will be sold. So there are companies in the real estate market that they predict uh, which would be the sale of a price to identify which are good deals something that is selling for less than we should. <coughs> Advertisement is another classical example. Is that they want to predict which art, which advertisement are you more likely to, leak and to click on. Image classification is an interesting one. There is a contest that uh, is uh, designed so that the community of research that is uh, doing image classification 
can understand better what is in the picture. So the task is that you are given a picture and you need to say out of thousand categories what it is, if it is a sheep or if it is a, I don't know, it's a dog, it's a cat or whatever. And we reach a point where it's uh, much better than humans uh, figuring out what is in the picture. For self driving car, the part that is doing the object recognition is uh, also done with machine learning. Uh, if you use uh, Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant, it's, uh, the speech recognition and synthesis is also <coughs> done with ma by machine learning. Language translation, I use it a lot for, for translating <laughs> English to German, German to English. Playing games, I've not just seen the news about uh, Alpha Zero Go, also Alpha Go Zero, Alpha Zero AI and uh, also playing go games like uh, Super Mario and so And they learn the how to play just knowing the rules and they develop a, st a strategy on how to play best. Some examples on, on space, some of you might know it, uh, maybe some of you don't still. Uh, so for instance, Dr. Mast is named after Mast and is a data analytic tool to do automatic diagnostics in case of an anomaly. Uh, so when there is an anomaly, we can automatically identify which are the possible causes from telemetry only. Here I show you an example that uh, uh, I take it from a paper we did for space at the time. And there was some attitude error in Dino's Express and Dr. Mas found that the reason for that was that when uh, a scanner called Aspera was initialized, it was introducing talks in the platform. At that time, it was a bit remarkable because nobody th was thinking that the uh, payload will influence in the platform. So that's uh, nice also about it. Another example on in space would be novelty detection. And what uh, we realized is that Usually what happens before you get an anomaly is that a behavior is unusual. So an unusual behavior is often uh, the precursor, if you like, of an anomaly. So we look for unusual behavior and tell flight control engineers that something maybe is uh, suspicious. This is an example. And while it, it is simple, I like it better because there is no <coughs> way you can get uh, this in, in that of limit. For instance, in this case, uh, we got the alarm here, and two months later, we got that limit. So it's something, uh, uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, it's uh, this time I'm telling you that it's, uh, it's much better than what it looks like, because at that time, you don't know how much time you have, no? But you know already that it's something suspicious. Uh, Thermal power consumption. This is a problem for every satellite. And I'm looking at uh, Red and Luke, uh, <laughs> that they were in very much involved in this project. And uh, we, together with the Advanced Concept Team, organized a, ma a machine learning competition. And in this machine learning competition, the goal was to predict the thermal power consumption uh, for two Martian years. And the data we gave them is uh, no, it was one motion year, so two Earth years, and we gave them like three motion years as uh, data that we knew. And the results were quite uh, impressive, and now they're, they're working on how to make it operational. Another example is the prediction of uh, entry and exit of the radiation belts for integral. And for them, it, this is quite relevant because uh, just because of this uncertainty on the effect of the uh, radiation belts, they switch off or they protect the payload earlier than what is really necessary. And if they will know in advance uh, with a high accuracy what the right time wa will be, then you could uh, get a much uh, science return. This was a nice one. 
is uh, not only for NAMI, but also for text. This was in collaboration with the communication office. And the goal was to predict which articles will receive a higher number of views. So even before publishing in the ESA website, an article you will know if many people will read it or not. And the what we found is these are the topics. So if we're talking about ESA company technology, it's of very low number of views. What we're talking about Rosetta, Comet, Surface, <laughs> Crater, these kind of things, if we have a high number of views. So it's a we understand like this what interests people. So enough <laughs> for examples. And uh, I want to mention some consideration no? when we're using machine learning. First one is that uh, there must be a pattern between the data and the results that we want to extract. If there is no pattern, there's nothing to be found. So no lottery winning. Uh, so we cannot predict no? the lottery numbers because there is no pattern. The amount of data should be enough. Enough in the sense that uh, enough that we can discover this pattern in comparison with the complexity of the model that we use. And it must be difficult to formulate this relationship with a formula, because if it would be easy, we will use the formula instead. So we're looking for something that cannot be expressed <coughs> with a formula. How the learning happens? Wh what is the learning of the machine learning? Well, we have different machine learning techniques for different kind of tasks. And the learning is finding which are the model parameters that represent best the input and output mapping. This is maybe a bit abstract, so I prepare an example of what does it mean. And the easiest thing I could find is uh, to have a linear regression. If you have a linear regression, you have two parameters, M and B, and parameters in the sense that the model is parameterized. So you know that your solution is going to look like a line. And learning is finding which are the values of the parameter. And in the you can have any uh, parameter, uh, parameter value, but we are looking also to minimize the error. No? For instance, if I have this data, I can fit this line. These are the parameter values for M and B. And this is what learning means in a very simple model. We can have more complex models. For instance, we can have polynomials. We can have decision trees. And decision trees, the knowledge will be which are the decisions we take, which are the node we choose. Uh, we can have support vector machines. And the, the parameter we are looking for are the vectors in this case. Or, for instance, neural networks. And we are looking for which are the values of the weights. Uh, the way our solution looks like is very much uh, what we decide it will be like. So if we use a line, we can adjust however we like the parameters of a line, but it will be only a line. Or if we do a tree, it will be like a, have the shape of having the uh, decisions and notes and so. Could be better or worse, but have this, uh, this way of thinking. So we are a bit constrained by which model we select. We will discuss all these models in, in, in the new in next uh, sessions. So what type of learning do we have? And the type of learning depends a bit <coughs> on the level of supervision we can apply to the model. So we have supervised and supervised, semi-supervised and reinforcement learning. So for, sup for supervised, our supervision is that we can tell for every case what the correct answer was. For the case uh, of the thermal power consumption of Mars Express, we know, not in the future, but uh, in the past, we knew at that time what was the correct thermal power consumption because we can read it for telemetry. So this is what is called supervision. At every point, we can say this is the error that you're making and this is the right answer. And the focus on supervised learning is to predict the future. So we want 
predict the future most more than anything else. So sometimes it's difficult to understand what the machine learning is doing or the model is doing, but somehow we can accept not having full understanding because we care more about predicting rather than understanding what it's doing in some cases. No? And supervise is uh, the opposite. So the level of supervision is that there is no right answer. We are looking for insights while looking at the data. And the focus is more understanding the past. Of course, you want to understand the past to make improvement for the future, but you really want to understand the past because that you're not looking for any right answer, you're looking for insight. An example would be the, the market uh, basket analysis that supermarkets do. For instance, now for it's uh, quite clear for us that the milk is close to the cheese, but uh, it was not always like this. It was discovered that people who buy milk also buy cheese, and it was decided that to put them together so to maximize the cross-selling. So Semi-supervised is a bit of a mixture of the two, and the supervision is that we can tell what the correct output was for a limited number of cases, or sometimes for a, limit, a very limited number of cases. For instance, we're starting now a project with the Space Debris Office, and the project is that we know that for Sentinel 1A there was this uh, particle impact crashing on the solar array. And this was seen also in telemetry. So you see a drop in, uh, in power, you see a bit of change of the attitude, but there are more things that now we don't know. So based on this known case, we want to understand what it changes in telemetry so that we can detect smaller particle, not only in Sentinel-1A, but also even other Sentinels, and use this to calibrate the space debris uh, models for particles. For reinforcement learning, the supervision is that we only know the final outcome. For instance, when playing Go or chess and so, we know if you won or if you lost, but we cannot really tell which of the steps that you took led to victory or make you lost, so we don't know. So the focus here is more to find which is the next action, which is most likely to lead you to, to winning, if you like. And the type of learning that is mostly used in the industry, can you guess? <laughs> supervised, yeah, it's supervised learning, and it's uh, some of the people call it predictive analytics, and it's about predicting. So predicting what uh, you will buy, predicting which advertisement you will click, predicting how much this house will be sold for. So this uh, is most, uh, more where the applications are. And depending on what you're predicting, we can differentiate two cases. So we can have a regression or classification. And uh, regression is to predict real numbers. So if you're going to predict uh, telemetry, or we're going to predict uh, how much a house will be sold for. This is what we call regression. And classification is predict which option of, of a limited set of possibilities do we have. For instance, for the spam filter, there's only two possibilities, spam or non-spam. For this uh, other case of what is in the picture, in the contest that was organized, you need to predict which object it is out of 1,000 categories. So I would like to discuss now a bit of the machine learning workflow. So if you have a problem that you want to solve with the machine learning, which are the steps that uh, you should take? And uh, first is understanding the problem. And I think this one is easy because uh, if it's you're going to solve a problem you have, you understand quite well the, the problem. Next is the to have an evaluation criteria. So how will you measure how good you're solving the problem? Uh, because uh, otherwise you don't know if it's already solving as your expectation. So are you going to measure 
maybe how good it is uh, classifying. So you measure, measure accuracy or you measure the error in predicting. Next thing would be a baseline. So once you decide which evaluation criteria you have, you know how you're doing it now. So you can measure how you're doing now and how your current baseline measures again this evaluation criteria. Because only then, when you go with this machine learning approach, you can decide if this is really improving what you're doing, or maybe is that for a 3% improvement, I, I'm staying the way I, I am because it's simpler, maybe. Prepare the, the data, so you need to have enough data. And also, it's uh, quite some work to do some data transformation. So when you have the data, usually you have it in different sources. Maybe you have telemetry somewhere, you have fly dynamics somewhere else, or you have some data in websites. In that isn't uh, you have uh, data gaps, you have outliers, you have <coughs> the data in different sampling rates. So you need to put all together. And it's not only the data gathering process, but it's also that you need to encode your knowledge. For instance, if you know that uh, we are predicting the thermal power consumption and the distance to the sun is something that influences, instead of just putting the distance to the sun, you can say, hey, I know that the square of the distance to the sun to the inverse, so inverse to the square of the distance, is actually a better prediction or influences uh, in a way that the model will understand better. So you need to put your knowledge, uh, if you especially if you don't have enough data. Train the data, this is a easy, the easy part. You define a criteria and you find uh, the parameter that uh, minimize your error. And then uh, you need to do some error analysis. So you need to get uh, to understand what the model is doing right, what the model is doing wrong. And based on this, you might decide that you need a more complex model, or maybe that you need a simpler model, or you need more data, or you gain some understanding of the, of the problem. And once you've done all of that, then you realize that uh, your model is ready for production. And for production, I mean is that you want to use it sort of operationally. This uh, means that you need to get it uh, to the interfaces, and if you, get the if you need to get some data automatically, you provide all these interfaces. Uh, I would like to discuss a bit this middle part, uh, mostly the evaluation criteria and the error analysis, and put some examples. For the evaluation criteria, I think this is the, the only formula we have today. And this is a typical measurement for regression. So if we're going to predict real numbers. And what it means is that uh, this is the estimated value. This is the real value. We square them, and we just add together and do the, the average. Hmm? And basically, we compare our estimation with the real, and this will be the error, the green line, the square um, to the average. And to make the, the, this example, I prepared this data that I, I invented. So I created this, uh, this line, and I put some noise to make it a bit more interesting. And I uh, used two models. The one on the left is a linear regression, and the one on the right is a polynomial regression of degree seven. So we compute the error. You see zero three for the line, zero two eight for the polynomial. Therefore, the winner is uh, the polynomial, and we go for the polynomial. But uh, somehow this doesn't feel right, and the reason it doesn't feel right is because we want machine learning models to generalize. So generalize is that they are able to perform well for data that we never see. And if we expand a bit the range, we see that for linear model, it somehow follow our intuition, the way it should work. But for a polynomial, it's a total failure. So something is, is going wrong here. 
And the issue is that for us, it's quite easy to see that because we can plot. But usually what happens is that we never have like one dimension or two dimensional data. We have usually many, many dimensions in machine learning. So we need to figure out how uh, or, or when this kind of thing is happening that we have a model that is not really serving us in the sense that it will not generalize well. So how to detect that? And the solution is that from the data we have, we can split the data in two. So we can have some data that we use for training the model, for fitting the model, and some other data which is for testing how well we are generalizing. And we are supposed to train the model on train data only, okay? So when we do this, this is what happened. And you see that we have a very low uh, error for training and testing. And here the error for testing is quite big. So this is the trick. If uh, we know that this is happening, this is called overfitting. And when you have overfitting, means that your model is too complex for the kind of data you have, okay? So uh, I give you some guidelines for your data. In case you have a training error which is low and a test error which is high, then you need a simpler model. And or you can also do with more data. And this is called overfitting. You can have the opposite, which is that you have a very uh, uh, a model which is uh, underfitting, which means that you have a high train error. If this happens, it means that uh, your model is not able to learn the data. So you need a more complex uh, model or, or you need more data. Usually what happens is that uh, maybe what you have is a function of some data and there is some data that you're not putting or that you need so to do some more features. This uh, having high training error and low test error is unusual, so it doesn't happen often, so, but I put it there for, for reference. And when you have uh, a low error, everywhere that you've done, and, uh, you can uh, go and use your model. So if we go effort-wise, how much effort the, this thing requires, is the problem understanding requires quite some effort, but if it happened that it's you're solving a problem that you have, then it's much easier because you have all, all the knowledge you need. <coughs> uh, the most of the effort goes on preparing the data. So if you need to have uh, more data or to prepare more features, and especially think about what might influence, this is where the time goes. And of course, for, for production, you need to put to make sure that all the interfaces that you need uh, will be there. So if you need to interface with telemetry or with flight dynamics or the emission planning system and so, this is also time consuming. So I think uh, we covered a lot today. So now you know what machine learning is, some examples. Uh, which are the type of machine learning we have, regression, classification, <coughs> and this uh, workflow, and the very important, uh, the generalization problem, that we build in models so that we want to predict them well in the future for data that we don't understand yet. So the, this lecture will be available in the ISA uh, community and data analytics in Italy. So you will find it easily. And what we're going to do next is, in the second session, we're going to dive more on techniques. O all the other sessions are more for techniques. And they will have two parts. One part where we discuss how the technology works. And then we do some Python uh, hands-on. This was a bit more uh, generic that applies to any kind of techni technique where we discussed today. So that's from my side what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you for your attention. And if you have some questions, 